Yo, I'm Nash Bandit, and today I'm here with something ever so slightly different. And by that I mean it's more music related stuff. Are you surprised? I'm not. But what exactly am I covering this time? Well, as some of you may know, I am a hardcore KISS fan. I'm a lifelong fan of the band and could honestly tell you anything about any of the band members. Hell, my name's origins are within KISS. And <laughs> I, I have the rose tattoo, the Paul Stanley tattoo. That's how deep my love goes for this band. But despite KISS's fame, there's some aspects that aren't spoken about very often. And unsurprisingly, I'm drawn to these obscure bits, as I always am. One of these aspects is one of the former members of the band, Mark St. John. Now, while he was on one of KISS's best-selling albums, that being 1984's Animal Eyes, this doesn't mean that he really received the same attention himself. After all, with him being struck by reactive arthritis, and with him not meshing with Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley very well, it was only a matter of time before his departure from the band. And once Bruce Kulick was performing live with KISS, it was pretty much sealed. Mark only did two and a half shows, and he didn't make a lot of appearances with the band either, aside from select interviews and press appearances, plus the Heavens on Fire music video. But Mark's tenure in KISS isn't what this video is about. If anything, I could make a video on that alone. And odds are that I might, because it deserves its own video. There's a lot of shit, ranging from Mark hardly getting to rehearse with the band, to the whole situation with Gene hardly being there during the recording process, and the bullshit Paul said about Mark. Ah, yes, the man who was a guitar teacher prior to his tenure in the band couldn't play the same thing twice. Sure, Paul. And I love Paul, don't get me wrong, but the man says some dumb shit from time to time. Everyone does, after all. That aside, this video is about an even more obscure part of Mark's career. White Tiger. A short-lived band that had the potential to become big. A former Kiss guitarist, a former Black Sabbath singer, and some good songs if you ask me. The band only released one album, but even then, there's more beneath the surface. So, without further ado, let's dive into White Tiger. So, firstly, let's get some background on this to show some of the origins and to set a timeline for the band. As we all know, Mark St. John's tenure in KISS ended in late 1984, after a long struggle with reactive arthritis. Whether or not he recovered in time, KISS had already decided that Bruce Kulick was the better fit. They had rehearsed with him more, and they had done most of the tour by that point with Bruce. And they found that they meshed with him better than they did with Mark. So, Mark was out of the band by early December of 1984. But by early 1985, Mark had pretty much recovered from his arthritis, likely improving with the decreased stress after his departure from KISS, and he had begun writing songs and making demos. But he wasn't doing this alone. Enter David Donato. Around the same time as Mark was in KISS, David was working with Black Sabbath, singing on a few demos, most notably a song called No Way Out, which can be found online nowadays. However, due to conflicts within Black Sabbath, the lineup he was in dissolved entirely, and despite there being no issues between David and the rest of his then-bandmates, he wasn't brought back to the next lineup. Though he did work with Geezer Butler again at one point, this also wound up being a fruitless endeavor. So, he would wind up working with Mark again on these demos, Hey, wait, again? Yes, again. Apparently, Mark and David knew each other prior to their work on the White Tiger album, and their more knowable band tenures. And there's actually an interview that backs this up, which can be found in the book Sabbath Bloody Sabbath by Gary Sharp Young. Not only is this talked about by the writer of this book, but there are direct quotes from David that talk about his reactions to Mark joining Kiss. I'll read one now, as the chapter was posted online and has been archived. Thank God. Donato's long-standing alliance with Norton, though, would be rudely interrupted when the guitarist was plucked from Clubland and put into the spotlight with the self-styled greatest rock and roll band in the world, KISS. Mark copped a gig, the KISS gig. 
He was afraid to tell us, recalls David. We knew he was going for the gig, and we were outrageously hoping for the guy. But when he got it, he couldn't tell us. He actually cried, and that's how much it got to him. I really felt for him because he was really eaten up by the whole thing. Actually, though, it made me even more determined to push myself forward. As for Mark and David's previous collaborations, the two of them were in a band together. The band started with David Donato, J.R. Sainz, and Neil Citron, and apparently Glenn Hughes joined the group as well. Neil would soon be replaced by Mark, but not before the original group recorded some demos that have not seen the light of day as of me writing the script. So yeah, Mark and David had a prior connection, which undoubtedly made it easier for them to form a band. And fighting a bassist was even easier, with Mark's younger brother, Michael Norton, filling in that role. After all, with Michael apparently having been Mark's guitar tech during his tenure in KISS, it's pretty clear they had a good relationship. As for the drummer, this is where a man named Brian James Fox comes in. And he's yet another member who just fell right into place. Mark and Brian would often wind up running into each other playing through clubs in Orange County, California. And they'd watch each other's bands perform. As such, when White Tiger was being formed, Brian was a candidate in Mark's mind. And David's as well, since he was bound to see Brian just as Mark had. And the management for White Tiger would have Brian listen to some of their demos. He liked what he heard, and that was that. The band was formed. But there is one thing I'd like to mention that I don't think a lot of people know. White Tiger wasn't always known as White Tiger. There's a photo of a poster I found online where they were called Flying Tigers. I don't know how long this name lasted. Odds are it may not have lasted very long. But maybe they saw all the other band names with the color white involved and wanted to hop on the bandwagon. Or or maybe they felt it was fitting because white tigers do exist and it'd make a badass sort of mascot or logo. Which, I mean, it does. But that's a fun little fact that I wanted to share really quick. Now, as for the recording of the album, it was also pretty straightforward. After all, with the demos, all they had to do was have some parts properly recorded and have everything polished up. So, on October 19, 1986, they released their first and only album, which is a self-titled debut. I've seen some people call this album Year of the Tiger due to the back cover saying this, but none of the members or managers or anyone involved with White Tiger has ever called the album by that name. If anything, it's just a play on the fact that this album was released in 1986 which just so happens to be the Year of the Tiger in the Chinese Zodiac. Which one of you guys was into the Zodiac stuff? Because, same here, I'm kinda into Zodiac stuff because it's just cool, you know? That aside, I think I'll look into the songs and talk about them a bit. After all, I did this with my video on Kane Roberts' Phoenix Down, where I talked about Under a Wild Sky. So it's only thing that I do the same with White Tiger. By the way, if you're interested in Kane Roberts, check that video out. But that's enough self promo for me for the moment. Before I get into these songs, I'd like to note that all of these songs were written by Mark St. John and David Donato. That way, I don't have to say this nine times. There's nine tracks, by the way, which are Rock Warriors, Love Hate, Bad Time Coming, Runaway, Still Standing Strong, Live to Rock, Northern Wind, Stand and Deliver, and White Hot Desire. Now, let's get into it. Rock Warriors is the first song on this album, and serves as the perfect introduction to the band. They are rock warriors and they don't hold back. That's exactly the kind of start you want for a debut album. It starts with Mark soloing before David's vocals kick in, and it gives you a good taste as to what to expect from this album. Not just in sound, but in lyrical content. Most of this album falls under being written to get your blood pumping, with less of a focus on more... horny lyrics, as I like to put it. And the chorus is just so badass, with lyrics like Saviors of the Steel and We Came to Win, Fight Till the End, White Tiger comes out swinging. And I wonder if David's inspiration from Ronnie James Dio had an impact on this. It's not impossible. 
This song would receive a remix on a reissue of this album, which seems to have released in 1999. And it is remixed by... I... Michael Wagner? Wait, no, you're kidding! Holy shit! Everything is connected! Holy shit! Um, okay, well, for context, the main reason I know of Michael Wagner is his involvement with Alice Cooper and Kane Roberts, and I didn't expect there to be a connection here. Um, anyways, uh, David has said that he wished that more of the songs received remixes like this, but that they lacked the money only to find out that Michael Wagner would have been willing to do it for free. Well, at least we got a taste of this new mixing, so it's not all bad after all. As a fun little tidbit, this song has some live performance footage posted online by Brian James Fox. Though the audio has been replaced with the studio recording, as Brian felt the audio was too low quality, it still shows off how White Tiger was in their stage performances. Now that's cool. Moving on from that, we have Love Hate, a more fast-paced song, which again starts with Mark Sowing before David's vocals come in. And I'm already seeing a pattern with the lengths of these songs. A lot of them either get close to five minutes or hit the five minute mark. This song is pretty catchy with the chorus, Love Hate, It's Got To Be A Fine Line. It also covers an unhealthy relationship, which isn't an uncommon theme in songs of this era. Interestingly, this song has a live performance posted online from back in the day, from none other than Brian James Fox. And not only that, we get to actually hear the live audio. I'll play a clip of it here. This is really cool. How funny is it that we have more footage of Mark playing on stage with White Tiger than we do of him playing live with Kiss? It's funny in a sad way. The next song is Bad Time Coming, and this breaks the cycle of starting with a solo riff. It starts with Michael and Brian's rhythm with just drums and bass. And what the fuck? Come on now. Six minutes? That's a little ridiculous. But hey, if Alice Cooper can get away with it, so can White Tiger. This also continues the themes from Love Hate, where it talks about a declining relationship. Runaway is the next song, and we're back with the riff introductions. And this time, we're back with the lyrics that are meant to get you pumped. Let Your Spirit Fly is one of the sickest lyrics I've ever heard. And man, does it fit so beautifully into this. It gives this song a feeling I think could be used in some sort of cinematic setting. Seriously, listen to this song and tell me that you don't get this image of someone in a big fight, escaping before they fall in battle. And boy does this song have a lot of soloing in it. Something tells me that Mark had fun with this one. The next song, Still Standing Strong, continues this sort of get your blood pumping theme, and when paired with Runaway, it feels like a turning point. Why run away when you're still standing strong? That aside, this song once again starts with the soloing intro into David's vocals. This feels like a signature thing now. This song feels similar to Rock Warriors, with the vibes of leading the Rock Warriors into battle. And the listeners are in for the ride. And of course, this song fades out with more soloing from Mark. I think at this point, we should just expect that with all of these songs. Here's a song that I feel like would have fit more at the end of this album. Live to Rock, aka what I feel like would have been the rock and roll all night to White Tiger. I mean, come on, listen to this. It says it in the song. I'm right. That aside, this is a rallying anthem that continues the get pumped vibes of this album. Live to rock, rock to live. 
As a fun fact, this lyric would be the one that David Denaw used in autographs. I wonder if this was his favorite song that he did with White Tiger. Oh, also, they say ass in this song. We get White Tiger saying one naughty word as a treat. Additionally, the reissue adds a cheering crowd to the end of the song. This isn't on the original vinyl, and I would know, as I own both the CD and vinyl versions. I am a woman who owns two copies of the White Tiger album. Northern Wind returns to the vibes of Runaway, with a dramatic, tragic, and cinematic sound. This song seems to be a fan favorite for fans of White Tiger, and for good reason. This song invokes such vivid images in my head. It seals the deal of this sort of mystical warrior vibe that White Tiger has for me. The acoustic guitar in the background adds to this, and with lyrics speaking of why I interpret it as a mystical savior bringing hope among the people, it feels like something that could be made into some sort of fantasy story. I feel like White Tiger could have totally made a concept album. There's some potential here. And hey, I like Kiss's music from The Elder, so it's right up my alley. Though unfortunately, this song was apparently never done live by White Tiger. I'm not sure why this is, but maybe they just didn't feel it'd be done justice when done live. That's just a guess, though. The next song is Stand and Deliver, which again, continues the general theme of this album. Songs that are a rallying cry, a call to get your blood pumping. With lyrics like you carry the world on your shoulders, who elected you to save the world? This is a song that has a personal favorite for me. Interestingly, on the vinyl version, the song fades out earlier than it does on the CD version. Again, I'm not sure why this is, but hey, the more White Tiger, the better. This song also has an interesting video connected to it. Rehearsal footage! Yes, believe it or not, there's White Tiger rehearsal footage. And unsurprisingly, it's posted by Brian James Fox. Man, he's a lifesaver with this footage. I'll play some of it now, actually. funny to see how high up Brian's drum set is here. What a rehearsal space! The last of these songs is White Hot Desire, which is the one song where I guess Mark and David thought, hey, we need a song with horny lyrics. I think the name alone indicates that, but the lyrics of course further prove it. And hey, White Hot Desire, White Tiger. Uh, the song starts out sounding more fast-paced, with a sort of feline-esque roar from David. The song slows down on the guitars until the chorus hits, going back to how the introduction sounds. And with lyrics like So Hard to Tame, I feel like this song really plays into the white tiger... motif? Is, is motif the right word? Theme? You know what I mean. It plays into the aspects of the name of the band. However, with the way the song ends, it feels like the perfect way to end the album. Even though I did say earlier that I feel that Turok would have been a better outro, this one works just as well. Because it ends with this sort of flourish, this flare. And there it is. The album is done. And that would be it for White Tiger. As while they did do club performances throughout the next year, nothing more came from these four. The label, EMC Records, apparently saw no potential singles in this album, and as this was an independent label, this more than likely impacted how far White Tiger got, even with a Black Sabbath vocalist and a kissed guitarist. So, unfortunately, this was all White Tiger had. Except, well, it wasn't exactly the end. It turns out, after this album, Mark and David worked on more songs, or maybe they had some other songs on the cutting room floor that they decided to fit on the next album. Yes, there were plans for another White Tiger album. There were seven songs recorded, and the Sabbath Bloody Sabbath book, David mentions that there was a name for this album. 
on the prowl. Man, what a sick title. Fitting for White Tiger. They had a lot of fun with the tiger theme. I'll read a quote from the book, which gives us more information on this. White Tiger wrote a second album, but would grind to a halt. Fans were simply of the misapprehension that the band had simply vanished. Although behind the scenes, work was in progress. Mark and I wrote another album. It was good stuff. Mark is a speedball on the guitar. The guy could do anything on the neck. He's like an Alan Holdsworth kind of player. But I was maybe looking for something a bit more like a classic four-piece, Sabbath kind of thing. Mark was amazingly fast, but sometimes the slow hand approach is good too, you know? Anyway, we had this album, On the Prowl, ready to record. We heard a rumor of an offer to our managers, which was apparently refused. We were never made privy to it. That's how White Tiger ended. So, there was one final attempt at pushing White Tiger further. But once again, the management put a damper on it. And I don't mean this as an- Oh, they intentionally sabotaged White Tiger. I mean this as in the stars simply didn't align, and it seems that doubt may have clouded the management's minds. And it's a shame, because these songs are also pretty good. And as such, I'll cover them now. The seven songs are Wild Wild Women, Communicator, Where'd Our Love Go, Face the Love, Live for Today, Break in for an Answer, and Young and Hungry. Again, these are all written by Mark and David, so I won't repeat myself with each song. Let's dive into these tracks. Wild Wild Women starts off with a fun guitar riff for Mark before going into David's vocals, which fits in perfectly with the pre-existing White Tiger songs. After all, it makes sense, there wasn't much time between these albums, and as such, there are bound to be similarities. However, it seems this album would focus less on the Get Your Blood pumping songs and more of the sort of sex and rock and roll aspect. But don't get me wrong, those sort of motivational lyrics will still find their way into these songs. But on the topic of lyrics, a lot of it is not very easy to make out due to the audio quality of these tracks as apparently they were recorded in a garage. That's, that's not an exaggeration, that's not a joke. I'm pretty sure I've seen Brian James Fox say specifically it was recorded in a garage, but at the very least it is listenable. Next song is Communicator, which is arguably the most well-known song out of these demos. Not only was this one of two songs from this unreleased album that White Tiger would do live during their club shows, but it would eventually get some sort of release in Mark's later album Magic Bullet Theory, being re-recorded and just instrumental. It's a very fast-paced song, and the motivational lyrics return with The power of rock compels you on before the solo hits. This song feels comparable to love-hate with what can be made out, seeing as it's about relationship troubles once again. As for the Magic Bullet Theory version, the only members of White Tiger to appear on it are Mark and Michael, as Brian does a drum on that version, and with there being no vocals, David is completely out of the equation. It also has some differences in its arrangement, which doesn't surprise me as this tends to happen with re-recordings like this with any musician. It's also an interesting insight to how Mark and Michael's playing evolved since the 80s, as Magic Bullet Theory released in 2003. It's arguably the closest thing we have to hearing Mark's playing in a more modern age. I've uploaded both the Magic Bullet Theory album and these unreleased demos here on my channel plus another album connected to Magic Bullet Theory called The Mark St. John Project, so check them out when you've got the chance. The next song is Where'd Our Love Go, which continues the themes of ill-fated or troubled relationship-related lyrics. And it's a ballad, which only further drives the lyrics home. This makes me wish that this had been on the first album, as I feel like that album could have done with a ballad. Northern Wind is in the ballad before anyone tries to suggest that it might be. I'm not sure if anyone thinks it is, but I'm not taking any chances. Regardless, this is a good song, and if you put it into some 80s movie where there's a slow dance scene, I think it'd work really well. The next song, Face the Love, continues this love-related lyric theme, with a softer intro before the guitars really kick in, with Mark soloing before David's vocals come in. Again, that's very signature at this point. It's hard to make out the lyrics, but I could pick up on this being akin to Paul Stanley's Love in Chains, 
a woman who has tried to close love out of her heart, and David is trying to get her to open up. Man, this makes me wish I had a lyric sheet. I've tried asking around, but it hasn't been a fruitful endeavor. If anyone could get me the lyrics, or if you know anyone who has them, please let me know. It'd be really helpful. The next song is Live For Today, and this is why I consider it the second most popular song of this bunch. With it being performed live alongside Communicator, this song has seen some of the light of day as a result, though not quite as much as Communicator has. It's a return to the motivational Get Pumped lyrics from the first album, where now the tables have turned in terms of the ratio of these motivational songs to the love-related ones. There's also a point in the song that is clearly meant for encouraging the crowd to sing, where the instruments die down as David cries out, LIVE FOR TODAY! This song also has some interesting video footage, as Brian posted rehearsal footage of this song as well. I'll play some of it for you guys, just like I did with Stand and Deliver. I'm still in awe of the fact that there's actually a good amount of footage of White Tiger performing. It's honestly a miracle. Now, the next song is called Break In For An Answer. I've seen it be called Break In For THE Answer as well, but feels like it's an answer rather than the answer when you actually listen to the lyrics. Anyways, this song feels akin to Northern Wind to me. But with the lyrics I can make out, it is undoubtedly continuing the lyrical themes of troubled relationships. Lots of turmoil in these songs, it seems. The next and final song is Young and Hungry, which I can compare to White Hot Desire, with a similar sounding intro where David lets out a shout to start the song. This song fits the era very well, with lyrics like so right, yet so wrong, Young and Hungry. It's definitely got some similarities to White Hot Desire, and to me, it feels almost like a successor to it. And with that, this truly marks the end of White Tiger. With no singles from the first album and no release from the second, the band would fizzle out. There was no real conflict, but the band burned out and parted ways. Mark and Michael would find themselves teamed up with Peter Chris of all people, working with him on a project called The Keep, which at some point was also called The Tree, though this project didn't get far. There were a few demos recorded, which can be found online, and a few of these would wind up on Mark's future albums, Magic Bullet Theory and the Mark St. John Project, having Phil Nero on vocals. There was also one live performance with Mark, Michael, and Peter, and recently it was actually uncovered and uploaded online. So I suggest you check it out, as there's also a Q&A with it. I know Michael did more music stuff, even appearing alongside Bryant on another project, but not much has been heard of him in recent times. He and Bryant have interacted fairly recently though, so all seems well for him as far as I know. He also appeared at a KISS Expo to talk about Mark shortly after his passing. As for Mark, I think we all know how his tale ends. Mark would make some appearances at KISS conventions and expos and released two albums. Magic Bullet Theory and the Mark St. John Project, but his health would decline. Drug issues, jail, and a death from a hemorrhage that happened under very murky circumstances. I won't go into further detail on that as I do not feel it is my place to do so, but that is how it ends for him. David would continue to embark on searching for more musical opportunities, though eventually he would begin working with motorcycles though he would sometimes hop into the club scene and join bands and sing with them. But for the most part, he lived a more quiet life, out of the public eye, save for an appearance at a KISS Expo in January of 2017. I haven't seen any footage of this, but apparently he and former White Tiger manager Eddie Koralnik did a Q&A there. Some photos of David from this event have surfaced online, so we get to see how he looked in modern times. Unfortunately, however, after falling ill, 
David passed away just last year. I don't know the specific circumstances, though Wikipedia says it was apparently throat complications and asthma. As for Brian, he has performed live in more recent times and is by far the best source of information on White Tiger. He's posted loads of footage of the band and some foes as well. After White Tiger, he joined a band called Silent Rage, a band that was actually managed by Gene Simmons. What is up with these guys working with KISS members? You can't escape them. Though Brian didn't actually play on the first album from Silent Rage, he is credited as doing so. But he has stated that he did not play on that album. He also did an interview recently where he dives into White Tiger a bit, and I'd suggest you give it a read as it's a nice insight into the band. He's also got a YouTube channel here, and if you're into his drumming in general, or if you want more insight into his career over the years, check it out. And one final thing, because you and I both know that this video is missing an angry bandit rant. Supposedly, there was another album from White Tiger called Raw, and I want to clarify something here. Much like with Kane Roberts' Phoenix Down and the album New Place Now, the Raw album isn't Mark St. John's White Tiger. I've seen someone specifically say this wasn't Mark's album, and Brian has said that as far as he knows, this album wasn't associated with the White Tiger he knows. If people could stop spreading that misinformation, that'd be really fucking nice. I literally took it off the fucking Wikipedia, and someone put it back. Stop that! Shoo! It's a different White Tiger! While Raw does exist as far as I'm aware, unlike Phoenix Down's new place now, Raw is not Mark and David and Michael and Brian. Got it? Good! Now, let's end this video with my thoughts on all of this. White Tiger was the big start in me hunting down information on obscure projects. It's not the first Kiss solo project I got into, as that title belongs to Fraley's Comet. However, this is the most obscure Kiss solo project. Which is a shame, as these songs are pretty good. I wish more was done for this band, and hey, apparently White Tiger did get kind of big in Sweden. I have no idea why, but it's something. Though sadly the same cannot be same for America, and that makes me sad. But with Brian James Fox being around still, I'd say that maybe we'll get more White Tiger footage and foes in the future. At least I hope we do. As for Mark St. John, I feel Mark as a whole is rather underrated. While I understand not everyone likes the shredding guitar style, I feel people are too quick to dismiss Mark's playing. Especially after what Paul Stanley said about- Seriously, why do people believe this? Oh, right. Right. That's because they can't be bothered to look further into it. I feel like if more people knew of Mark's past as a guitar teacher, then they'd question Paul's logic. Because, again, the guitar teacher couldn't play the same thing twice. Sure. Mark wasn't a bad guitar player. He knew his techniques, and he was very educated on this stuff. I recommend listening to interviews from Mark Online, as it provides a new side to the story that most people may not have heard before. And for David Donato, I wish we got more musically from him. I do like his singing, and while it's not everyone's cup of tea, it sure is for me. At the very least, we've got two albums worth of his musical work, and even a demo of his Black Sabbath days. And as a final note, I'd like to thank Brian James Fox for providing so much about White Tiger to me and many other White Tiger fans, as he is an absolute lifesaver with this stuff. If you watch this, Brian, I hope I did everything justice here. If I didn't, you can correct me as you please, and I will gladly make some sort of update or pin a comment, whatever is needed. I'd also like to thank anyone who has embarked on the same journey as I have with finding out more about White Tiger and sharing it online. Without them, I'm not sure how much of this video I could have made. And I'd like to pay my respects to Mark and David. May they live on forever through their music and rest in peace. Right, so I think I've covered everything here. This has been Nash Bandit, as Kane Roberts would say, rock the fuck on.